This video covers inferential multivariate statistics. So rather than just look at ordinations and dendrograms, we actually want to make some inferences on populations. Maybe we want to test difference between treatment means or particular groups of sample points. So we already had one technique covered that does this, so multivariate analysis of variance. But there are actually better techniques um, that are distance-based and not rotation-based. Um, so I would recommend to always use these. They are really your only option for high dimensionality data. So if you have lots of variables, uh, then these are the only ones that work. And these permutational multivariate analysis of variance approaches are also non-parametric. So you don't have to worry about assumptions of normality and homogeneity of variances. Now, before we do that, uh, I do want to briefly cover principle of inferential statistics and, um, and what the p-value really means, because there tends to be confusion uh, around the interpretation of these uh, statistics. So let's also briefly check where we are in our toolbox. So we'll be covering the multiple response permutation procedure and the distance-based permutational maneuver as a distance-based alternative to the uh, multivariate analysis of variance that we did earlier. And um, inferential statistics are really uh, restricted to uh, this column and also this one here, so the constraint gradient analysis. This column here is equivalent to a univariate correlation analysis. So we'll have one data set, for example, species communities responding or correlating to another data set, which could be something like climate data or soil properties and so on. So this inferential multivariate statistics section is what we'll cover next. So let's start with an example that we um, are probably all familiar with by now. These are ordinations for four field experiments. You know, it could be anything, but let's say it's a grazing experiment. So we have a control grazing business as usual, and then we have two alternatives, treatment A and treatment B. And we want to see what happens to our community of grasses as a function uh, of these treatments. So species that are indicated here with vectors would respond differently. For example, uh, the species 4 here likes uh, apparently treatment B and so on and so forth. And um, these plots differ a little bit. Uh, so 1 and 3 are experiments which have smaller sample sizes. So n is just equals 3. Uh, these are bigger experiments. and um, I could ask you the question now, what is, what is the probability that the, these group differences are just due to random chance? So it's possible, you know, if I have a result like this, there's always going to be a difference between those treatment means, but it could very well be that these are not real effects, right? this, this is just noise. So if I were to ask you, what's the probability that what you see here is just noise, you know, and, and not a real treatment effect? What would you say for these four experiments? So if I look at this carefully, let's start with the one that seems most likely just a random scatter. Well, I would say th four, that still looks like there's some effect, but uh, three, that looks pretty random to me. So this, this could be a 0 0.8 chance that this is just noise. And um, if I look at the one that is the most unlikely to be just random noise, I would say it's this one. So here the green cluster is completely separated from the blue and the red. Uh, this would not happen by a random chance. So I would say, you know, that's one in 10,000 times that, you know, that kind of separation would appear by random chance. So I'm going to give this a 0 0.0001 or something like that. Maybe even less of a chance that that's just random. And um, these two seem a bit intermediate. Um, I think, you know, the, there is a small effect here, but it seems quite clear that these centers are shifted. So I don't think that would easily happen by random chance. No, I, I'm, I'm giving it a 20% chance um, that that could be random. And um, this one here, yeah, I don't know. It, I mean, the red and the green are clearly separated. But then you also have just few samples. So I'm, I'm also going to give this a 20% chance, you know, that that's actually not a treatment effect. Uh, I, I don't trust this result. I do, just don't think there's enough sample points. So those are p-values. So that's what the p-value really means. Uh, it means what is the probability? 
uh, that these group differences uh, are just random chance events. So what's become clear with this little exercise is that uh, the certainty that you know these group means are different is a function of the sample size. So you generally trust things more if there's a whole lot of uh, samples and the effect size. Um, so in this case we have a relatively large effect size in the first uh, two experiments, uh, less so in the second row, so these are not as far separated. But then it's also a measure of sample size, so if your sample size is large, uh, you tend to have a little bit more confidence than if the sample size is small. Even intuitively, I, I think uh, you would trust an experiment with a larger sample size more than uh, an experiment with a smaller sample size. Uh, in both cases here, whether it's a large effect size or a small effect size, doesn't really matter. Uh, this one is always more certain than this one. And this intuitive relationship of certainty, I can also uh, actually quantify this as a signal to noise ratio. So how big is your signal between uh, the means uh, compared to the noise uh, within my groups? And you know you can do this in, uh, in a univariate situation, but it works just as well in multivariate space. So I can ask how far, how distant in my ordination are those uh, group means? So what's a, the what's a variance among those group means? And what's the variance within uh, my groups? So a big value divided by a small value would, be, uh, would inspire confidence. And if my signal and noise are about the same or even the other way around, then you would say, well, I'm not quite certain whether that difference is real or whether it's just a random sampling artifact. And uh, note that uh, you know this is uh, two of those experiments um, that have actually the same effect size, so the same between variants and also the same within variants, but this one has a bigger uh, sample size. So, And we said that we're actually more confident in the one with the larger sample size. So the signal-to-noise ratio calculated that, that way from my data is not the whole story. So my signal-to-noise ratios, just based on the data, are in this particular case identical, but our confidence is not. So we are missing one more piece of information here. So we were asking a slightly wrong question. Um, the right question would be, how certain are we in the means of our groups? So we don't really care what the distribution of the data is. We wonder how certain we are uh, in terms of the means. So if my sample size is small, then you know that certainty may not be very high. So my within variance is quite large. But if I have a big enough sample size, I'm, I'm quite certain in the precision of my means, so that variance within uh, is quite small. So the signal to noise ratio is not signal to variance within data, but to variance within group means. And um, that poses actually a slight problem. Um, so how do we find the variance within a, a group mean? So I only have one, right? So I only have one mean for my data. So how can I infer how variable that is? And um, so there are a couple of options um, to deal with this. So the first one would be to repeat the study a couple of times. So if you were to repeat the study, you would get each time slightly different group means, and uh, that would give you a sense of the variance. Now, that's, of course, uh, very inconvenient. Uh, you don't necessarily want to repeat your study every time. Um, so one British guy had a rather brilliant insight that you can estimate the variance of your group means from the variance of your data. And it's a variance of the data divided by n, by the sample size. So that's amazing that that works, but it really does. Um, it only works for parametric and normally distributed data. But that formula here, so the variance of the data divided by n gives you the variance of the means. Um, it's usually expressed uh, in standard deviation. So you take the square root on both sides, and then you have the standard error. So that's a standard deviation of the means is the uh, standard deviation of your data divided by the square root of n. Um, this is how multivariate analysis of variance does it, the variance within or your noise term in an analysis of variance. And then your signal divided by the noise would be your F statistic. But you can also do it with a brute force simulation. So this is what we're going to do with a permutational maneuver. And uh, so what 
you do in this case is you actually simulate a repeat study over and over again. So we'll, we'll see in the next video how that actually works. Both work amazingly, uh, equally well. So this does require a little bit more uh, computer horsepower. So you couldn't have done that in the 1920s when uh, this was invented. But now that we have computers, this is just as easy. You can simulate distribution of your means based on the distribution of your original data. So it turns out that even if your original data is not normally distributed, uh, the distribution of the means is maybe slightly skewed, but it's almost normal. So both uh, two and three work equally well, even for non-parametric data. So analysis of variance or multivariate analysis of variance is actually quite robust against the assumption of normality, because your assumption of normality is that your means are normally distributed, not your data. Okay, now that we um, have our signal to noise ratios, we're actually ready for statistical testing. Um, and that's common to virtually all statistical techniques. Um, it's almost always a signal to noise ratio, or sometimes it's signal subtracted by the noise. But generally, this test statistic is always bigger if you have a larger signal between your groups. It's smaller when you have a lot of noise. Uh, so if your data is very variable, that leads to a smaller t value or f value or z value or k square uh, whatever uh, test statistic or whatever particular test you use but they all work on the same principle so your test statistic is then related to a p value uh, that you can calculate from that signal to noise ratio so the test statistic tends to uh, be influenced a little bit by your degrees of freedom so your f distribution is not always the same shape depending on what your degrees of freedom are but in principle, the signal-to-noise ratio, if you have a signal-to-noise ratio of four, and so four times the signal than the noise, and that also leads to a very small p-value. That is what the p-value really means. It's that signal-to-noise ratio expressed as a probability that the difference that you observed is due to random chance. So that's an important concept because you always see some difference, right? So if you have a treatment A and treatment B, they will never be exactly the same. They will always be somewhat different. Um, the question is, what's the probability that that difference is due to random chance? So if it's high, then you say it's non-significant. But if it's a very low probability, then you say they are statistically significantly different. And that's that's actually that statistical significance. That does not mean that your research has value or that that statement has value. Because you still have that confusion with sample size and effect size. You don't know why that p-value is small. Uh, you know, is it because you have a big effect, which would be important? Or is it because you have a big sample size? Um, so in that case, a very small p-value may not mean anything particularly important from a practical standpoint if you're effect size is very small. You were just able to detect it because you had a large sample size. So for impactful research, you need to disentangle effect size and sample size as reasons for your certainty, so as reasons for the p-value. And I'll sh give you an example in the lab on how you can do that. Now, if you do a multivariate analysis of variance, um, it's almost often useful to follow this up with uh, univariate statistics because the effect size can actually not very easily be disentangled from sample size if you have multiple variables with uh, each having an individual effect. So you need some sort of summary statistics and uh, if we think about our grazing example, maybe what we're interested in is how well species diversity is maintained in the alternative grazing treatments. So I can calculate across all the species uh, a single value that says species diversity for that particular plot under grazing, grazing regime A or B. And um, I then converted my multivariate uh, analysis into a univariate problem. So my dependent variable now becomes species diversity. So I can make more precise statements like this research showed that grazing treatment X maintains at least 80% of species diversity with 95% certainty. And that's not really possible uh, in multivariate analysis of variance. So oftentimes you follow that up with a univariate analysis. So just some examples for other things you could do. This research showed that wheat treatment A reduced invasive species by at least 70%. So in this case, my summary was just a subset of my species uh, that I had a particular interest in. Or we may have a result that says, here we show that soil amendment X 
led to at least 30% more ground cover in a reclamation experiment with 95% certainty. So again, these are strong statements. Uh, that's definitely better than just saying, oh, there's a significant difference between soil amendment X and soil amendment Y. P equals 0 0.05. These are much more precise statements. So in many cases, you have to follow up your MANOVA with a univariate analysis where you summarize all your individual variables. So in this case, many species that you have in your reclamation plot and you summarize it by total ground cover. And you can almost always do those summaries, for example, heavy metals in a water quality study or weeds in a community ecology analysis or perhaps pollutants in a river ecology study or a drought index in a climatology study. There are almost always ways to summarize some of your variables, either all of them or some of them, to also follow up with a univariate analysis. So there's an example in the lab where you can and see how that works. So you can follow up a multivariate analysis of variance with a univariate analysis of variance. Um, and that can either be small numbers of measurements. So if you have, let's say, an agricultural study where you have yield and then a number of nutrients and vitamins of interest, you could actually do univariate analysis of variance for every single one of them after you've done a multivariate analysis of variance. Uh, if each of the individual measurements is of separate interest, or you can, you can create these summary variables or, or indices. And the reason why you don't want to jump straight to ANOVA but start with a multivariate analysis of variance is that it protects you against false positives. So if you have a bunch of separate ANOVAs um, and you test for significant differences in yield and nutrient A and nutrient B, vitamin A, vitamin B, and so on, so you'll, you'll do a series of tests each with an alpha level of, say, 0 0.05. So there's, there's still a 1 in 20 chance that you make a mistake in each of your individual ANOVAs. And uh, those add up, um, and that's why you start with a MANOVA. So only if you have a significant difference in your multivariate analysis of variance, then you follow up with a univariate analysis. And again, uh, that's the same idea as with uh, multiple inference and pairwise comparisons. Uh, that's typical univariate statistics material. So in the lab, I also give you a link to other videos that you can check out if, you, uh, if you're not quite familiar with these concepts.